So with that, um, I will um, now introduce uh, Dr. Bronwyn Swinnerton, who is our first uh, invited speaker. Um, Dr. Swinnerton is a senior research fellow in digital education in the School of Education at the University of Leeds. And Bronwyn has worked for many years um, in the area of online and digital education and has produced a, a large number of very impactful research findings. Um, she's also uh, a very committed educator um, on our masters in online uh, in, dis in digital education that's offered online. Um, so today Bronwyn is going to be speaking about online learning and digital equalities in higher education and I will pass over to Bronwyn now. Bronwyn, welcome and thank you. Thank you so much, Neil. Um, I just was panicking a second then because I lost all connection, but now I'm back. <laughs> uh, could you put the slides up, please? Thank you. So, yes, as Neil said, I'm Bronwyn Swinnerton. I'm a senior research fellow in digital education in the School of Education. And today I'm going to be talking about online learning and digital inequalities in higher education. Next slide, please. So before COVID, online education was massively increasing. There was a massive growth across lots of higher education institutions. And that talk took a number of different forms. Uh, MOOCs, massive open online courses, lots of other online courses that higher education institutions might develop themselves. Micro-credentials are something that is, is emerging now, which are shorter courses where you can take those credits and stack them up into bigger courses. And then some places are developing online degrees. And so why might people want to use online education for continuing professional development? People who work full time, people who want to upskill in the job they're in, online education is perfect for them. Anybody who wants to do lifelong learning, online education is again, really, really useful. MOOCs particularly cover a wide range of topics and people can go in and look at them free to begin with and then if they want credit, if they want certificates, then they can pay extra. So part of the idea about online education is that it will widen access. That flexibility of any time, any pace, anywhere means that potential students who can't come to campus for whatever reason, they may have caring responsibilities, they may um, have employment responsibilities, or they may just live in another country where they cannot come to um, the campus they want to do the course. So they, they can do an online course, which can be cheaper because they don't have to travel, they don't have to move away from home, and they don't have to pay for accommodation. So online courses have opened up education to students all over the world who wouldn't otherwise be able to attend a higher education institution. Next slide, please. Previously, I was involved in a research project. This is a project that uh, Neil was, um, which Neil led. It was an ESRC funded project in collaboration with the University of Cape Town. And it took place between 2016 and 2018. And we were looking at the intersection of digital technology, marketization, and the unbundling of teaching and learning provision. And this was where higher education institutions would partner with private companies use digital technology to develop online provision. We carried out the research in South Africa and in the UK. And one of the key findings was due to the digital divide in South Africa and also to a lesser degree in the UK, online education often excluded those for whom it was thought to actually widen access. And this was due to many students not being able to afford a digital device, not being able to um, get access to Wi-Fi, Data in South Africa is one of the most expensive um, in the whole of Africa. And they also may not have appropriate levels of digital literacy. Next slide, please. So what happened with COVID? So when there was the pivot to online teaching and learning, if, the, if, if online education widens participation, but for some it might not because of the digital divide, I was interested in what impact did this have on students? Were some groups of students disadvantaged? by the pivot to online learning. I was also interested in how have staff experienced the pivot to online learning? And then from this, what have we learned about online education for the future? Next slide, please. So I talked about the digital divide and it was something that's been mentioned by other people this morning. 
Lots of people talk about digital divide as if it's one thing, but there are really three levels to digital divide. And the first level is the lack of access to an appropriate device or Wi-Fi or data. And this is the, an example of the first level of the digital divide, actually having the wherewithal to be able to go online. The second level refers to digital literacies required to effectively use the internet and digital technology. And is related to the view that simply having access is not sufficient to reap all the benefits of digital technology and the internet. You need to know how to effectively um, learn online. And then there's the third level, which is the outcomes from using the internet. This digital divide is when having access to and using the internet doesn't bring any positive outcomes. Next slide, please. And I, because I'm interested in this unequal experience, I started looking at inequality and I'm particularly interested in Thurborn's theories around inequality and the three um, types of inequality that he talks about and the four mechanisms that perpetuate these types of inequality. Next slide, please. And so in this particular study, I was interested in Thurborn's reference to resource inequality, the inability of human actors to act to their full capability. And in this particular context, do they have the resources required to go online and to learn online? Are there some groups that are excluded? Are there some groups that are not disadvantaged? Next slide, please. So the data that I'm going to talk about today, and I should say this is a work in progress, the um, GISC carries out, um, they develop digital experience surveys, which are administered every year. They do four different ones. They do a student survey, a staff survey, a research uh, survey, and a support staff survey. And they do it in higher education institutions and further education institutions. And for a number of years, we have administered this survey at Leeds. It's been a bit different this year because the questions have been much more geared to what's happened during the online pivot. And so they were asked questions such as what were the issues you um, came across in the last two weeks? So it was much more asking about that immediate um, response to what had been going on. And so they suggested we use this as a pulse survey, which we did. We administered it in November and we administered it in March. And you can see that we got large numbers of students both times, and then not quite so many staff, but still quite good in, in November. So what I'm going to talk about now is some of the results from the November survey to both staff and students. Next slide, please. So in November 2020, the majority of students were learning, on, were learning online because of the pivot to online. And the stats from the survey tell us that 89% of students who answered the survey were learning fully online. 45% of those were learning at home, not in student accommodation and not on campus. And that led me to think about how some students must have gone home or stayed at home and not come to university as they would have done and not been in Leeds as they would have been. So 53%, oh, sorry, they, well, they were asked a question also, when you uh, registered at the university, what was your expectation about the sort of um, teaching you would experience? And 53% had said they'd expected a fully, camp fully campus experience, 41% blended and 6% fully online. And I think that's partly to do with um, what year they're in. So people who were third years when the, uh, in November 2020 will have registered before anybody knew that COVID was going to happen. But it did mean that 6% of students expected to be learning fully online whilst 89% actually were. So what did this mean to students? Well, students were learning using a device. They had to learn, they had to use a device because everything was online. And that device needed to be used for a wide range of activities and they needed Wi-Fi and data for much more of the time than they would have done if they'd been on campus uh, pre-COVID. And where were they learning? Well, they needed space, they needed a desk, they needed peace and quiet. And if they were in student accommodation, whether that be university or private accommodation, they probably had that. They may not have had peace and quiet, but they will have had space and a desk. Students who went home might not have had that. Their bedroom may have been taken over by somebody else when they left to go to university. There may be parents at home working from home, also maybe educating younger children. 
They also needed to know how to learn online. They needed a certain level of digital literacy. Next slide, please. So what I did when I got all the lead survey data was I added some additional data, um, some additional student characteristics, particularly um, polar four quintile data. And this tells you what area um, a student comes from. The areas are divided into five categories. Polar one quintile are the areas where the fewest proportion of students go to higher education. And polar five areas are those where the most students go to higher education. And it's seen as a sort of socioeconomic um, measure really of where somebody comes from. Then I did additional analysis and inferential statistics and we also coded the open questions. Next slide, please. So there was a set of questions that are really, really um, interesting to look at that first level of digital divide, the access to being able to uh, learn online. And the students were asked in the last two weeks, which of these issues have you uh, experienced? And 13% said they had no suitable computer or device. 15% no safe private area to work. 66% said they had poor Wi-Fi connection. 22% had issues with mobile data costs, and that obviously might link as well to the Wi-Fi connection, because if your Wi-Fi connection is not good, you then might have to pay for uh, extra data. 29% had access to online platforms and services issues, and 24% had problems with accessing specialist software. 77% had at least one of these issues, 49% of students had more than one of these issues, and 11% of students had three or more of these issues when studying online. Next slide, please. So I was interested, as I said at the beginning, were, were some students more affected by these issues and this first level of digital divide than others? So I looked at these uh, issues by gender, by ethnicity, by place of learning, and by polar four quintile. Next slide, please. So when we look at uh, gender, we can see here that the orange is female and the blue is male. And females experienced all of these issues more than males. And all of these differences are statistically significant. And females had a mean number of problems of 1.82, whereas males were 1.44. Next slide, please. And as I said, I also looked at this in terms of ethnicity and the, the results were a little bit more mixed here, except we can see on the top line of each of them, the yellow are white students and white students tended to suffer these issues less. And overall, they had fewer problems than other ethnic groups. Next slide, please. So I also looked at place of learning. So I was looking at those students who were learning in student accommodation or on campus, and that's the um, orange, and those who were learning at home, which is the blue. And you can see that those students who were learning at home suffered these issues much more than those who were in student accommodation. And all of those differences are statistically significant except no suitable computer device and need specialist software. And those learning at home had 1.75 number of problems and those learning in student accommodation had 1.58. Next slide, please. So I was interested then about who was learning at home. Why did some people go home and other people didn't? Well, we can see in terms of gender, there's not much difference. As expected, older students tended to be learning at home and they may already they may have always done that. A mature student would tend to not go into student accommodation. They'd stay in the home they were living in. But we can see here that still 45% of 19 to 21 year olds and 53% of 22 to 24 year olds were learning at home only. In terms of ethnicity, Asian students were more likely to be at home and that could be cultural. Some uh, literature does suggest that. But I think what's really interesting is if you look at the polar four quintile, those students who came from polar one quintile are much more likely to be learning at home. And we would need to do more research into this. And I think it's a really interesting area to look at as to whether those from poorer areas went back home for financial reasons. Because if you look at polar five, where it was the highest proportion of students going to university, only 38% of those were learning at home. Next slide, please. 
And then I looked at the polar four quintiles on each of the issues. And here I was quite surprised. I thought that polar one students might suffer all of these issues more, but it, the only significant difference was in having a suitable computer or device. And if you look at the number of problems they had, it's really not that different. Next slide, please. These are some of the quotes from the um, open questions within the survey from students. And these are just some quotes about that first level of digital divide and the sorts of issues that students were um, coming across. So what can we do to help you learn effectively online, help to fund better quality of Wi-Fi, understand that personal circumstances can make online di learning difficult and appreciate the extra difficulty and stress that it takes to learn online where it's not always an ideal location to concentrate and study. Next slide, please. So Leeds wasn't different than anywhere else. The, the GISC um, survey results, when you look at them overall, are very similar, but also other people have been looking at this. An NUS study in September 2020 said 27% of students did not have access to internet at some point during the lockdown. And a poll by the Office for Students, they polled 1,416 students and said 72% had been affected by a lack of access to study at some point during the lockdown, 52% by a slow or unreliable internet connection, and 18% by a lack of a digital device. And Anthony Jack, Assistant Professor of Education at the Harvard Graduate School of Education, said COVID-19 is an, un an unerring mirror reflecting back just how equal, although I've put it unequal, our societies are. Next slide, please. So I also thought it'd be interesting to talk, I know I've only got a few minutes left, um, about what staff said about exactly the same questions. And these same six questions showed very similar um, levels of a digital divide. 20% said they had no suitable computer or device. 13% no safe private area to work. 55% suffered from a poor Wi-Fi connection. 8% had problems with mobile data costs. 26% access to online platforms or services. And 19% with access to specialist software. Two thirds of staff had at least one of these issues. And 41% had more than one issue. And exactly the same as students, 11% of staff had three or more of these issues when teaching online. Next slide, please. And the only way I could look at this in any sort of um, subgroups was by gender, and you could see that that didn't really make a difference. Next slide, please. And these were some of the quotes from teachers, and they could have just as easily um, been from students. You can see that the issues are exactly the same. Improved connectivity. One of the problems is that my work laptop is very old and needs replacing. Next slide, please. So if we go back to Thurborn and his four mechanisms, and I was particularly interested in exclusion, and he says the way that you respond to exclusion is to do things to uh, make sure that people are included. Arguably, the most important way in which inequality can be challenged is by the promotion of inclusion, whereby the way is made clear for those formally excluded from the body politic by ensuring rights and barriers against exclusion for all are upheld and maintained. Next slide, please. And so the university, partly in response to the GISC survey, but they'd already done this, um, the university has provided loan laptops to students who found themselves with inappropriate devices. It's also provided dongles for those having issues with Wi-Fi. It's got work planned to improve Wi-Fi in university student accommodation. And they've also provided advice for students in private accommodation about approaching landlords to improve Wi-Fi. Next slide. Thank you. Um, but when we think about uh, expanding online education, it isn't just students who are already in uh, university that we want to help. There's a digital divide in the general population. And we can see here in 2018, there were still 5.3 million adults in the UK or 10 percent of the adult UK population not using the Internet. Internet use varies ge geographically. London tends to have the highest levels of access. Women tend to have less access. Older people have less access and older women even less. Those with a disability are much less likely to use the internet. The economically inactive are least likely to use the internet, particularly those on long-term sick, 
leave or disabled. Internet access at home increases as income increases, while those who live alone are less likely to have internet connection at home. And a report commissioned by the Prince's Trust in the UK found that while 90% of young people have access to a smartphone, NEETs, those not in education, employment or training, and those with a deprived background have access to a smaller range of devices and in fewer locations, often not having internet at home and having to rely on others' Wi-Fi to connect. And the next slide is my last one. So one of the questions that we added to the March 2021 survey was asking students whether if they were to embark on a master's course, would they be happy for it to be online? And 16% of students agreed. And that was slightly more uh, for males, slightly more for Asian students. But if we then look at those polar four quintiles, the highest proportion were from polar quintile one and the lowest from five. And it went down through all of those quintiles. And that does give you, um, it gives evidence towards the fact that online education does make it more flexible. It does mean that people can work and do a part-time course. And that might mean that for those people who are less well off, that might be really important. Whereas those from Polar 5 are quite happy to come to a campus and not have to work. But that still then goes back to, they've got to have the wherewithal to do that. They've got to have the devices, they've got to have the Wi-Fi. The final slide has just got the um, references from the presentation. But I'm now very happy to take questions. Thank you. Th thank you so much, Bronen. Uh, this has been what I would call in my terms an avant-garde research. Uh, re really pleased to hear uh, all these findings. Uh, we, have, we can take one question, and there is one question that will appear on screen now. Uh, this is a question by one of our viewers, and we will come back to you in the last session for further uh, for you to answer further questions. So the question for now is: Will these findings be used in any way for distance programs that leads offers, and have there already uh, been informed decisions about uh, programs based on your research? Oh, thanks very much for that question. That's a great question. Um, this is research in progress, and I did a very short presentation for just three or four minutes last week at GIST, but this is the first time anybody's heard this research. So the research itself isn't influencing anybody yet, but the Digital Education Service at Leeds is very aware of the digital divide, and this has come out of other research that we've done. I think it's very difficult to give, you can't give, you know, we can't say, right, we're going to do online courses and make them available to people who don't have devices. You can't do that. But what you can do is really try to design courses that take account of bandwidth and take account of those people who don't have a lot of um, resources to buy data. And so you make sure that lots of the resources, the materials can be downloaded. You make sure the videos have got transcripts so that People don't have to actually run the videos if, if they uh, aren't able to. You also have to make sure that when you have synchronous um, activities within these courses, that you don't make people put their videos on. This can partly be to do with lots of people don't like it for all sorts of reasons, but it also takes a lot more bandwidth. And it might be that people with less modern um, devices just cannot put their uh, videos on during asynchronous um, activity. But there are lots of things you can do to, to make the course itself more accessible. 